Hey there, folks, and welcome to another update on Iceland. Today is Tuesday, March 4th, and we're all just kind of sitting and waiting, I suppose, on pins and needles, wondering when this next eruption might begin, uh, how long will the fissures be, exactly what point it will initiate, uh, and just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. I have a brief update for you, but at the end of the update, I've done a little bit of uh, compiling some of the past eruption events in terms of the earthquake pattern we saw. And I just want to do a little bit of comparison there and see what we can glean from looking at the past eruptive events. Thanks again for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Well, as you can see with the live webcam here, uh, for the most part in terms of volcanic activity, all is quiet on the Icelandic front for the time being. Um, looking to the northeast here, little gray, a little cloudy, a little bit of rain perhaps, and you can see the snow on the ground. Uh, part of the analysis we'll look at here is the, the weather the last... I guess month or so from what I've looked at and heard uh, has been pretty poor. Lots of storms, lots of winds, and overall the type of conditions that often hamper our ability to collect all the, the critical data we'd like to. So we're probably not seeing as much in the way of the, the seismic data. We're probably not seeing uh, maybe the GPS data as precise as it might be otherwise. But I think with the data we have, we can still make some broad interpretations and learn a thing or two. So the Met Office came out with a new update today. Um, not much new here, um, a similar tune to the last update last week as we kind of wait and see uh, in terms of this eruption. But the big takeaways here, are land, upli land uplift continues at a similar rate. Uh, they mentioned the weather uh, affecting uh, the, their ability to detect some of the seismic activity and some of the other instrumentation that they have there. Uh, still maintaining the idea, like we saw with the last eruption, that it could start with very little warning, not a whole lot of uh, precursory signs in terms of seismic activity and such. Most likely scenario is a fissure opening between Sunukur and Stora Stogafelt. So that's the same. We're expecting the, the same region to be the most likely location where this next eruption uh, begins. Uh, the area impacted by an eruption is determined whether the eruptive fissures extend north or south. This is an interesting idea because we don't always see once the initial vent opens up, it doesn't always move laterally north and south an equal distance away from that. Sometimes there's a preferred direction for the ground to kind of open up and unzip as that magma makes its way to the surface. Um, so those are some of the hard-hitting things there without reading some of the nitty-gritty details there. I'll put a link in the description. They also include a graph that they've included as they have in the past showing each uplift and eruptive event. So each little colored line here that trends upwards is the uplift between eruptive events. Uh, it's a little hard to see these yellow bars here, but there, you can see the very short window of time between these first three or four eruptive events. Uh, then the duration of this event here is much longer. Um, and you can see here going into the summer of 2024. And then here's where we are currently with our last eruption being on November 20th of last year. And then the uplift data we've been tracking since then over the last three plus months. And you can see now that the, the last uplift point here is higher than what we had for the November 20th eruption and about the same as what we saw for the August 22nd eruption. So some interesting things there. Graphically, if we look at just earthquakes in the last 24 hours on the Reykjanes Peninsula, not a whole lot to report, but again, uh, the weather has been a big a big factor in maybe um, showing a, a fewer earthquakes overall, but it looks like, you know, maybe five earthquakes there uh, in that area between Silingerfelt and Stora Stokfelt. So that area where we expect the next eruption to open up. A little bit of seismic noise, but again, not enough of a clustering in, in time or in space to indicate that the event is about to open up. Looking at the past week, and we'll come back to this data set a little bit more when we get to some of my analysis, because I wanted to look at, um, so this is the past, it's actually the past two weeks in the area. And you can see uh, where the earthquakes are. Here's Godendavik here, the Blue Lagoon. Uh, the Svartsengi power plant over here. Uh, and you can see where the earthquakes plot up. The size of the circle is the magnitude of the quake. The color corresponds down here in the bottom left corner to how recent the earthquake was. So a couple red dots that have occurred in the last couple days. And then as you go into orange, yellow, greens, and blues, the earthquakes get older. 
And what I wanted to do with this analysis I'll get to here in a second was look at the pattern of earthquakes, both the location of the, mainly the location of the earthquakes over the past two weeks leading up to whenever this eruption is going to occur and see if the location of those quakes, if we could look at some of the past eruptive events and, and use that as a bit of a predictor or not. Um, and this is incredibly flawed science because again, limited data set, this is small sample uh, in terms of the number of quakes we're looking at here. So by no means an objective measure, but just as sort of a maybe a, a point in time and a bit of information, uh, flawed as it may be to see where things might go. But this is our earthquake pattern over the last uh, few weeks. And what I was interested to see was that, you know, the area we expect the eruption to be, which is more or less in here, that the seismic activity the last few weeks has been a bit south of that. Again, no big interpretations there. I would not, you know, say that that necessarily means that we're going to see a vent open up further south, which obviously is bad news for Grindavik. But, uh, you know, the area we expected it to see, that the quakes there have been sort of at the south end of where we expect the vent to open up and then a little bit further south towards uh, Hagefeld down here. And so just an interesting pattern. We'll come back to that. Let's look at the GPS data here for a second. And we'll look at the Svart Sengi one. I think in my last update, the last thing we had seen was this little bit of a lull here, the last few data points at the end of February. But you can see those upticked a little bit. But again, we're not sure how much the the storms that they've just had um, and a, a slew of storms and very high winds and even like there was video I saw of like uh, water uh, going up into the parking lot at Reynes Fiara, the black sand beach down on the south coast and a flooding of cars in Akrenes and different places. So there's been some crazy weather there and so that might be affecting the data a bit, but overall we can still see the upward trend. I think the, the trend is there, may have flattened out a bit here the last week or so, um, but the overall picture is the same, and that is that this is a volcanic uh, zone or a magma storage zone that seems to be pretty much at capacity, uh, primed and ready to erupt or produce an uh, intrusion anytime in the next few days or possibly a week or two. Um, looking at the, uh, let's go to the, this is another pl way to look at the data. Let's look at the Svart Singhi station again, but look at it over time. Um, and this is similar to the Met Office graph, but I just wanted to show you a, a, just a different view of this. So this goes back to last March. There's the March 20, uh, March 16th eruption, the May 29th eruption the August 22nd eruption, and then the most recent one there, November 20th. And just to show you, this one just a little bit more nicely shows uh, that not only is the uplift, uh, the elevation higher than the November tw prior, prior to the November 20th eruption, but it's actually looking at this graph, it looks like it's even higher than what we saw for the August 22nd eruption. So in other words, we're seeing elevation at this GPS station at a higher point than we've seen with all the previous ones. And that's a bit to be expected because the idea is that you, you know, the elasticity uh, of the rock, as it con continually gets heated and warmed, it becomes a little bit more elastic. And so it can expand a little bit more. All these intrusions may be uh, creating, you know, more space underground as well, potentially. Um, okay, so let's get to the little bit of analysis I have for you here. So what I did, was I combined as best I could, and I just eyeballed this, this was by no means uh, super cutting edge, but I combined the earthquake data from this map here for a week prior to each eruption, starting with the December 2023 eruption, to see what the seismic signal looked like right up to and during the eruption. And then I kind of superimposed upon that um, using this data here from the Met Office. This is a nice map. Let me see if I can make that a little bit smaller so you can see it all. Uh, this is a nice map showing each of the eruptions where they started, and that's shown with a star there. And then the color of the line there is the fissure that opened up. So for example, the dark blue one here is the December 18th eruption. And when that vent opened up here, it continued to produce a fissure that extended out to about this point here to the northeast, and then sort of a staggered set of um, fissures that went down as far south as here. So you got a total length here shown on the map. And I wanted to just kind of compare that 
a little bit from place to place. So let me pull that in here now and show you um, what I put together. So here is, let's go ahead and just start these from the beginning. Uh, we'll roll through these. So here is the pattern of quakes for the first eruption on the Sunukur series from December 12th to the 19th. The eruption was on the 18th. So what I chose to do was go a day after because I didn't know exactly what time the eruption took place. Was it at the end of that day uh, where the, the date would flip over? So you can see the circles there. Uh, and of course, this one being the first eruption, you would expect it to have maybe the strongest seismic signal because it's as that magma works its way up to the surface, it's got to break all that rock, make space for itself and that would generate lots of earthquakes. So the yellow star there shows where that fissure opened up, and then the extent of the yellow line, again, just kind of eyeballed, not very uh, precise, but just sort of as a graphic, showing you where the extent of that fissure was in, from December 18th. The Grindavik is down here, Blue Lagoon, and the Svartsingi power plant. The red are the roads in the area. So we'll just go through these one at a time. I tried to keep them kind of centered here, but there's some interesting patterns. So if you remember, this one was a very large volume eruption. Uh, and then the next eruption in January, which is maybe the most noteworthy and a bit of the outlier when we look at the whole series because it occurred further south. And this was the eruption that actually took out and destroyed three homes in Grindavik. It was also very short-lived and, and small by volume eruption. So here's our seismic signal from January 8th to the 15th. Notice the earthquakes are a lot further to the south. This main zone where we'd seen so many earthquakes here in De uh, for the December eruption, um, just not a lot of seismic activity leading up to that. And that makes sense as well because we had um, a new area where this vent opened up. And so again, that necessitated breaking rocks. Looking back at this and with all the seismic activity further to the south right into town here in Grindavik, um, I think you know we really dodged a bit of a bullet I think it could have been a lot worse I think that one tiny fissure that opened up near the homes could have been a longer fissure or perhaps several fissures right in town so had this uh, eruption had maybe a little bit more magma a little bit more pressure behind it whatever just a small variable here or there it could have been much more destructive but luckily uh, it was not so there's the seismic signal for that January eruption of 2024. The next eruption started on February 8th of 2024. So here's the seismic signal for that event. Notice that the seismicity for the most part moved back up the, uh, the lineament here, back to pretty close to where that December um, uh, vent had opened up. This one, of course, produced a lava flow that went out here and took out the pipeline and uh, threatened the Blue Lagoon and the power plant and put lava up against the berms there. But there we can see where the vent opened up and the extent of the fissure. Again, just very crude and kind of eyeballed there. Um, so you can see where the, the earthquake pattern was. Then our next eruption in March was interesting because, <clears throat> and I, you know, it was interesting to look back at these because I didn't have all this recalled in my brain. But this one, most notably, I think is... The fact that this one produced not a lot of earthquakes, um, well, at least not a lot of large earthquakes. It was, you know, a big cluster at Fagodalsfjall, this cluster near town, uh, and then the cluster which proved to be the one associated with the magma movement, at least for the vent in this zone here. So here it is again, pretty close to where it was in February. There's again, there's again February. There's March, um, and then this cluster down here. But some of these. Um, yeah, who knows if this was part of just the magma chamber, maybe opening up new space along the marg this south margin of the magma chamber. Um, anyway, so that was the pattern in March. And that one <clears throat> maybe best matches what we're seeing right now, at least so far. Uh, but let's continue and look at the rest of the eruptive events. So the next eruption was in May. And you can see it was a little bit further south, um, somewhat limited extent. We can see the seismic pattern there for the May eruption. And then as we go into the next eruption here in August, this was the one that was further south and it opened the fissure up much further to the south, or excuse me, to the north, opened the fissure up much further to the north, northeast. Um, and so we had a, a very strong seismic signal there because we had not seen the fissure extend quite this far north with any of the previous eruptions. So the, these, these earthquakes here, 
makes sense in light of uh, that fact there. Uh, again, sort of a, an interesting cluster here, perhaps on the, the, the southern margin of the magma chamber or maybe just an extension of the dike here. But this vent that opened up here mainly opened up uh, to the north. So there's our August eruption. And then finally, our last eruption in the series was the one that came... It came early, at least based on what our sort of forecast was. It came several weeks, maybe even a month earlier than we thought it would when the uplift at the GPS stations wasn't quite as high as we thought it needed to be. And also it contained a lot fewer earthquakes. So the week preceding the November eruption, look at how few earthquakes we had there. Tightly clustered, uh, so it nicely constrains and defines the location of the vent and the extent of the fissure. Um, Kind of stealthy, right? This was kind of the ninja eruption that um, didn't come with a whole lot of fanfare and not much warning. They did detect borehole pressure changes, I think 30 minutes or so beforehand. And so they were able to get people evacuated from the Blue Lagoon. Um, but this eruption was interesting in that manner. Uh, and then looking, and then here we are with today. Here's, and this is not the same period of time. This is a little bit longer. I just wanted to capture a little bit more of the data there. So let me just roll through those real quick and kind of go through them quicker. So here's our December vent fissure <clears throat> and seismic activity. Here we are in January, sort of the, the anomaly here with the activity a lot further south. February, things move back up to the, you know, sort of main location for the vent, um, but also some, some earthquakes a little bit further to the northeast. March was a little bit quieter. Um, similar to the November one. Then we had the May event, which was a little further south and accompanied by a bigger, a stronger seismic signal. There we are in August, which uh, extended the fissure further to the northeast and had this very strong signal here, including this very large, this might've been a four or five right here, this big circle. Um, then we had the November event, which was pretty quiet. And then here's where we are now. So Again, I don't think I can draw any like hard conclusions off this limited data. There's just not enough here to really point to anything. It's, you know, there's not that many earthquakes. They're clustering kind of where you'd expect them to in this zone between the two hills. Um, and so we'll just have to see in the days to weeks to come how this all plays out. Hopefully with some good weather, we can get some better seismic data. And that's the thing maybe to look for, <clears throat> along with views from the webcam, that the eruption is has either A, started, or B, is about to start. But I wanted to share that little run-through of the, the seismic history for each of those eruptive events with you, um, just as something to look at. And, uh, happy to hear what you think of the data and your interpretation. So we'll see you next time on the next update, which might be during an eruption. We'll have to see. And thanks so much for your time. Appreciate your support of the channel. Be well and take care.